have you ever wanted a place like when Bam Margera got away with everything at his house and then Rob Deerdick had his own warehouse and I was always like, oh man, if I had this much property where I can get away with anything and no one could tell me what to do, then I would purchase it and get away with whatever I want to do. So you always hear these stories about growing up and be like, oh man, when I grow up, I want to buy that house where everybody has this, you know, dream house or this Victorian home or whatever else. I live on the street that I grew up on and I drove past the house that I live in my whole life and they had built a building behind their home in 96 with no permission and no permits and got an 88 page variance for it because it's actually legal in, in Marion County in Indianapolis where I live. But they ended up getting it approved and I was like, man, I could put so many cars in that backyard and so, or in that building and, and it was always kind of my dream home and no one ever fulfills I'm going to buy my dream home, but I did. So when it came up for sale, I bought it and I was like, oh, this place is great. And we just continually updated and, and improved the property. But when we got there, my wife Haley looked at me and it's an orange brick home. And she goes, you expect me to live in an orange house. And I'm like, oh, but look at the building. You know, she put up with me and we now the house is substantially nicer. But then it had all these acres behind it that were overgrown greenhouses and trees sticking out of these greenhouses that were 60 foot tall times 400 of them. And my neighbors to the north put their property up for sale and it used to make kind of an L behind my property. And I approached them and I said, I'd like to buy you these two acres off of you because someone that might buy it may surround me with goats or horses or something I don't want to be. I, it's not that I don't like goats or horses. I just don't want to be surrounded by them. So I ended up nipping off those two acres and then the other two acres just to the south came available. So that would be four acres attached to my parcel. And I'm like, cool, but this is woods and out of control, broken down glass greenhouses. So I bought a 1977 case backhoe that I had no business owning. And all it ever did was dig graves. I bought it out of a cemetery and I taught myself how to push over greenhouses and trees. So for three years, I was on those four acres cleaning it up and it now looks like a city park and it is just gorgeous and it's grass and it's property and it's everything I ever wanted. And we fenced it and no one can tell me what I can and cannot do on it and we can just have fun. So being a gearhead and everything, I was like, what can we put out here? And we ended up putting a walking path. And, you know, everybody could use some exercise. And we paved it. I mean, this is a nice, like, city park-looking walking path. And it ended up having, like, 12 turns and kind of zigzagged around the back property. And it was six, six and a half feet wide, just kind of nice. But everybody knows I hold the big Holden cookout at my house every year. And so we have an 82-foot-long, 15-foot-wide burnout pad that's concrete, basically behind my other neighbor's house. So the walking path hits that and kind of goes on. That was it, the end. But my friend Adam Valentine found a mini Ram go-kart. So it was like a Dodge Ram with a body on it. it looked, kind of looked like a Shriner cart. And it was the price was right. And I was like, hey man, you know, go, up, go buy it. And he always tells me that I send him to the scariest places on earth to buy things. But you never really know what you're going to get. And this guy may have been, I don't know, secret militia or something. I have no idea. But Adam was quite frightened when he got back with it. But now I got this little Dodge Ram and I'm six foot four. I look like a Shriner driving around in it. But now I'm booking around my go-kart path. That's a walking path. And now it's a go-kart path. So we're going to call it a go-kart track. But we have a permit for it. So we can do anything we want to with it. We were like, man, wouldn't it be cool if we had a go-kart race in your backyard, Travis? And I'm like, man, that's a terrible idea. Let's do it, right? We put out on the internet, let's come up with a go-kart race. But the cars, carts can only be six and a half horse and they all have to have a body on them. They can't be like, you know, a tube frame, whatever else. So we took what lawnmower racing was back in the day and we brought it into the current situation we're in now. And we have full-size grown men driving around in go-karts with a six and a half horse motor on it. So this would have to be something you would win at a grocery store or get at True Value or Lowe's or whatever growing up. This cannot be a race car to shift a cart. And it's just pure racing. So we're like, ah, let's call it something. How about the Backyard 400? How about the Backyard 400? 
So we're getting prepped for this race. My buddy Dan Dillon and I are auto caddying out the backyard and we had everything all lined up and we're like, how many people are gonna show up for this thing? Well, people started showing up and testing on the track. And then we realized that it was drastically too tight and tiny. So this $110,000 walking path that I have in my backyard now becomes $130,000 because we had to put $20,000 worth of runoffs and apexes on the corners and make everything wide enough for people to almost pass. Now, since last year, we have widened it again. So now this has become a $165,000 walking path slash go-kart track in my backyard. So all of this is leading to this race called the Backyard 400. And we tr you try to think of everything and timing and scoring. So if there was a world-famous foot of bricks, Indy has the yard of bricks, we put a foot of bricks and we put timing and scoring under it. And then we're like, going, okay, so what did Indy have? And they sing Back Home Again and, and the National Anthem. So we hired a guy to sing Back Home Again and my window washer guy that's super awesome, Noah, played with him on an electric guitar across the boom box. We need a grand marshal. And I'm like, somebody find a grand marshal. There's a comedian called Alex Morrison and he is hilarious, but he's famous for the 305, come alive. Boy, y'all look at what he done did now. He done put them big meat Larry Hoovers on the back. 305, come alive, boy. Somehow, Adam reached out to him and said, would you come and be the Grand Marshal for this guy's go-kart race in the backyard? So he shows up for the Grand Marshal. So now we've got him, and I'm thinking, all right, how many drivers show up? We had 43 registered. 33 of them showed up with running and driving carts. And these are cannonball run people. These are just friends from YouTube. These are, my neighbor was the pace cart driver. Like it was ridiculous, but it had a Talladega feel because we had camping, we had fire pit, we had all this stuff in the, in the infield. And it was just this huge party until the day of the race. We had a full toter home show up with four carts in it. Like it was ridiculous. So when you're planning for this event, you're gonna have 300 people in your backyard Everybody's got to use the restroom. So we hired one of those fancy air conditioned wedding toilet things. But after three days of use, the old wedding trailer was, was tired. And Chris Michaels coined a phrase I had never heard before. When the wedding trailer had ran out of water, apparently there was a toilet cobra. Never heard that one yet. We had people promise to fly in from all over the place if we built them a cart. Ben Wilson, Charlie Safari Wilson flew in from New Zealand if I made him a Richard Petty go-kart. And Richard Petty was his idol and he raced a number 43 Pontiac when he flew all the way from New Zealand just to race go-karts in my backyard. We single-handedly increased the price of all these goofy carts that have been sitting in people's sheds. And uh, you know, once they popped up on Facebook Marketplace or on somewhere, they were snapped up and gone because people were building carts from all over the place. All of the people and the competitors that we just asked to email in and say, hey, are you gonna be in this thing? They started posting pictures of their carts and they were like literally working on these things. We had rules, rule package, six and a half horse, usually this Harbor Freight Predator motor will get you through it. But it wasn't the speed that was gonna win this thing, it was braking because of the track. But uh, Tony Tolbert, took a, a Davy Allison Thunderbird and turned it into the Stroker 8 Chicken Pit Special. Um, Mitch Stapleton built a dead ringer for the Kevin Harvick car, Monte Carlo. Like it was the amount of work these people put in this and they were coming from all over the place just to race go-karts in my backyard. So it went crazy because they're like, if Travis is gonna put on this event, it's gonna be madness. And it was, but then we had like driver introductions. So I hired a mariachi band to play behind me while we had driver introductions. So what, I mean, it was just overwhelming. And I was like, man, this is really happening. But I was behind the scenes of it all, so I didn't really get to enjoy it. But some people are like, this is the greatest grassroots racing event that I've ever been to in my life. So what is the grand prize if you win the Backyard 400? I've never seen grown men be more competitive over a 1989 Z24 convertible in my lifetime, but that was our grand prize, a 1989 blue Z24 convertible. There was multiple paint swapped and fenders damaged over that thing. We would have three classes. We would have Indy carts, NASCARs, and street class. Obviously, an Indy cart is an Indy car body. NASCARs, they're falling out of the sky. Jeff Gordon bodies, whatever else, old old Indy, er, old NASCARs. 
and a street class, which would be like a Corvette or a, or whatever, or pickup truck or things. So after all the races came down, it was time for the Backyard 400. So we had three Indy carts, we had three street carts, and we had three NAS carts, and then the three transfers from the last chance race. So if you do the math there, that's 12 carts, Travis, and not 15. Somehow we ended up with 15. So we had all of these at the same time on the track, which is way too many carts for what this track can handle and as wide as it is. Mitch Stapleton came in from North Carolina. We had folks from Georgia. We had everybody, and they are all ready to see who's going to take home the 89 Chevy Cavalier convertible. Inverted the field, green flag drops, and they are gone. But remember, the slow cars are in the front, and these fast Indy carts are coming for them. And the track is so tight that there's footage of everybody cutting the corners and going, going through the grass, but there are trees in the way. And we had no problem with you cutting the corners, but you had to get back on the track before you lost a leg or, or hit a tree. And turn 11 was nicknamed the Widowmaker, and that was always the tough corner that you'd have to slow down for. And then turn 12 is a downhill blind right, so those were both two scary corners. And we had a couple wrecks or whatever else, but nothing very big the whole weekend. And then laps go by and the excitement's happen, and you get to the halfway and the Indy carts have finally passed the whole field and there's down to Justin and Juan and they are flying and just putting it on the, everybody. And then you have, you know, Chris Michaels is in it with the mini Ram and my brother-in-law and, and everybody's just booking around this. And then you hear the air horn, meaning red, red flag, because we had flags on all the corners and dead silence at lap seven. And I'm like watching everybody come down the start finish line and we're missing one cart and it's my brother-in-law. And I'm like going, oh my, of all people. And so I see my mother-in-law running up the hill and she's had both knees replaced and she's at a full trot, his wife running up the hill. And so this, they're going out to the back acre and at the Widowmaker, turn 11, he got punted in the corner and went, over tea kettle and the old 26 Quaker state was upside down. So needless to say, we had hired paramedics, but no ambulance. At least we can keep you alive while the ambulance gets there. And Alex was pretty tore up, but the whole weekend was good. We had to restart the race with three laps to go and Alex was out. And I mean, it was scary, but he, he made it. So I walk down and we figure out that we are going to do one pace lap and cut everybody loose. And the two fast carts were in the front. And little did I know that going into the seventh lap, now this would be the eighth and the ninth, and then the tenth, to win it all, that the lead cart had no brakes. And he knew it, but no one else knew. So he was the fastest Indy cart, and he is an incredible driver. His name's Juan. So they go for the pace lap, and then they cut him loose. Lap eight, lap nine, and during eight, Juan stuffed it in the fence because he had no brakes. Justin came around, led, led two of them, nine and 10, and he won the 89 Chevy Cavalier Z24 convertible. So it's not only, you know, hooray, you won a convertible, but now you've got to take the victory lap in the convertible. And our Grand Marshal Alex Morrison gets in there, starts it, and then it dies, and he starts it again, and he goes about 20 feet, and then it dies again. So perfect Cavalier form. But then he takes the victory lap. We have the champagne. Uh, we had the, of course, the quart of milk. And he drinks the milk and sprays everybody with the champagne and goes and kisses the world famous foot of bricks. And that was it. It was over. It was finally, we didn't kill anybody. Everybody said, man, the look on your face, Travis, was just pure fear the whole day because I had no idea if we were going to put people's legs on backwards. Like we had my attorney there early in the morning for everybody signing waivers and everything. And we had no idea that 33 carts were going to show up and almost 300 people in my backyard to watch go-karts race on a walking path. But it happened. So now they're like, hey, are you going to do it again? And I'm like, man, um, what do you do? Uh, you buy another 1989 Z24 convertible and we're going to do it again. But next year we're going to have four classes. We're going to have a truck and van class. So uh, of course, Ben's going to fly back over from New Zealand to race in the truck and van class. Apparently Sam Hard's going to fly in from the UK. There'll be a lot more to come. But if you race in my backyard, you too can win a 1989 Z24 convertible. This year it's white though.
even though my brother-in-law had the worst accident of the weekend, and he really got the bad end of the stick, the 26 Quaker State that he rolled us back together again, and it will be at next year's race, he calls me two times a month and to thank me for having a go-kart race in, in my backyard. And, uh, you know, I married his sister. I've got the raddest brother-in-law in the world. But out of all the things that happened on my property and everything that I've ever wanted it to be, in 30 months, the neighbors have only called the city to complain on me 17 times. When you get a ticket, it might look something like this, but the first thing that you need to do is take a picture of that ticket and send it to 305 305. That will get the ticket clinic on your case immediately. They've got brick and mortar offices in Georgia, Florida, and California, but they can help you find a ticket no matter where you get it in the United States by helping you find a local attorney that will do everything they can to help you avoid costly fines, insurance premium increases, points on your license, risk of suspension, even jail time. They've helped me out with this ticket and many others and a lot of my friends as well. So check them out now at the link in the description below or again, text your ticket to 305 305 to get the ticket clinic on your case. They are the perfect partner in your fight against any speeding ticket.